In the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, Naaman, the commander of the Aramean army, suddenly and unexpectedly develops leprosy, a development in response to which his wife, an Israelite, tells Naaman that in her land, which is to say in Israel, there's a prophet who can cure him of his disease. And so desperate for such a cure, Naaman mentions this possibility to the Aramean king. Well, the Aramean king, because he greatly values Naaman and his skill as a military leader, because he greatly values Naaman, this king grants Naaman permission to go and see this prophet in Israel, even though Israel is a sworn enemy of Aram. And so Naaman travels from Aram to Israel to see Elisha. But when Naaman arrives at Elisha's house in his fullest dignity, of course, which is to say with horses and chariots and emblazoned with Aramean regalia, when he arrives at Elisha's house, instead of Elisha coming out to greet Naaman, Elisha sends forth a simple servant who, on Elisha's behalf, offers Naaman a very simple instruction for how to be healed of his leprosy. Go, this servant says, to the Jordan River and wash yourself there seven times. If you do, your flesh shall be restored and you shall be made clean. Easy enough directive, right? Go jump into the river and have a bath. Seven times. Well, easy or not, Naaman isn't having it. For you see, Naaman came all the way from Aram to Israel to be seen by a prophet, not by some errand boy. And what's more, Naaman came all the way here to undergo some form of sophisticated holy treatment. Not to be told that he must simply just go and jump into the Jordan. The Jordan, a river that to Naaman's mind is far less impressive, far less majestic, far less significant, far less sacred than rivers of his own land. And so Naaman finds himself appalled by the very suggestion. And thus, aghast, he responds to Elisha's messenger by saying, and I quote, The Jordan, the Jordan, are not the rivers of Aram better than all the rivers of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be made clean? See, the very thought not only disgusts Naaman, it offends him. Surely, he thinks, something in Israel can't be more pure than something in my land. Surely, he thinks, the Israelites aren't somehow as good as we are. This week, in preparation for today's sermon, I found myself rereading this passage from 2 Kings. It's a marvelous passage. I encourage you to go and reread it. And reading it made me suddenly think of a memorable scene from Harper Lee's classic novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. The scene where Tom Robinson, the African-American man accused of assaulting Mayella Yule, a white woman, the scene when Tom Robinson is put on the stand to testify, we all remember this, right? If you'll recall, in that scene, after the lawyer has examined Tom Robinson for a while, it becomes clear that Tom Robinson has indeed been in the Yule house many times, helping Mayella Yule with various household chores. In fact, as the lawyer points out, Tom Robinson, by his own admission, has done an enormous amount of work for Mayella Yule and for no money. 
Now, as you'll no doubt recall, Maela Yule was a pretty pathetic character. She was profoundly lonely, subject to physical and verbal abuse from her father, responsible for raising her younger siblings, living in abject poverty, loved by and noticed by and appreciated by no one. And so when she would ask Tom Robinson to help her do things around the house, Tom Robinson would do it for free. To which the lawyer in this scene, incredulous about this, says to Tom Robinson, Well, aren't you quite the humanitarian doing all this work for nothing? And then he pauses and says, Why would you do that, all that work for no pay? And here's the important part. Here's the thrust of the scene. Here's the reason it's relevant for us this morning. In response to this question, Tom Robinson looks at the lawyer and answers very honestly and very sincerely says, I guess I just felt sorry for her. I guess I just felt sorry for her. A response that renders the lawyer, not to mention every person in that courtroom, aghast. You, the lawyer repeats, felt sorry for her. You felt sorry for her. The lawyer couldn't fathom it. Like Naaman with Elisha, not only did the very thought disgust this man, it offended him. For there was an unwritten code at work in the land, a hierarchy by which society tacitly functioned at the time. And Tom Robinson was bucking that code by suggesting that he might somehow be in a position to pity Mayella Yule. For you see, helping Mayella Yule for pay was one thing. Pitying her, however, was something altogether different. And so his words cost him the case. He wasn't guilty of the actual crime, as Harper Lee makes clear as the author. Everyone in the courtroom that day knew that. No, he wasn't guilty of the actual crime. But he'd just proven himself guilty of something worse of daring in such a broken and unjust world to suggest that he stood on a level plane with everyone else. And that leads me to today's scripture lesson from the Gospel of Luke. In today's passage, Jesus commissioned 70 disciples to go into the towns and villages nearby and proclaim his message. And as he sends them forth, he grants them authority. And so they spread out, authorized to go and do Jesus' bidding. And they do. And then weeks later, after having finished their mission, they now return to Jesus, prepared to give him a summative report of all that they've seen and done. And here's how the text records this moment. I'm quoting. And so the seventy returned to Jesus with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. And right here in this very scene, in this very moment, we see a window into the very heart of the gospel. Not, mind you, through what the disciples say here to Jesus... But through what Jesus says here to the disciples in response, do not rejoice at this, Jesus responds. Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice instead that your names are written in heaven. In other words, simply rejoice that you are known by and loved by God. You following me here? 
when the disciples return to Jesus, they are full of elation. They are riding high. But not because they've introduced people to the love and goodness and grace and mercy of God, which was the whole point. Instead, the text makes clear they are full of elation because they were suddenly able to make, quote, even the spirits submit to them. In other words, they are elated because of their sudden ability to wield power over. And Jesus' response here is what it is so crucial and critical that we hear. His response to them is not to commend them for this, not to encourage this spirit within them, but is instead to lovingly rebuke them for it. Do not rejoice at this, he says to them. Do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you. Rejoice instead that you are known by and loved by God. Again, I say, here in this moment, we see a window into the very heart of the gospel, into the very heart of God. Which is to say the gospel of Christ, being set free by Christ, entails not only experiencing love and joy and peace and goodness, which of course it does. But likewise, it entails desiring such love and peace and goodness for everyone. And thus, when we find ourselves as broken, sinful human beings doing what broken, sinful human beings do, which is taking quiet pleasure sometimes in the idea of somehow being above others or better than others or more significant than others. Or when we find ourselves angry at the suggestion that we may be equal to or on the same level as someone else, Allah, Naaman with Elisha or the lawyer with Tom Robinson, in such moments that come upon us as broken human beings. In such moments, we can be certain that right then we are once more missing the heart of the gospel entirely. For it's this very sense of being somehow set apart and over and above and altogether different from. It's this altogether ungodly division that we by nature so easily create between us and them, whoever they are and whoever we happen to be. It's this very thing that the gospel seeks to free us from, not licenses us to go forth and exercise. And that is precisely what Paul is saying to the Galatians in our epistle lesson for today. In fact, this is the very point of this whole magisterial letter. There is no longer Jew or Greek, Paul writes. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, but all are made one in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to conclude that thought by saying this So then, let us work. For the good of all. So then let us work, Paul writes, for the good of all. That, dear family, is the Christian call. To work in Christ's name for the good of all. And let it not ever go unsaid. That is A tall task. Because to work for the good of all doesn't simply mean to do good work for all. It instead means to try to establish good for all. The difference is all the difference in the world. Because when we do good work just to help some without without sincerely desiring that they one day not need our help, 
we, while serving them, still retain the distinct pleasure of feeling ourselves somehow above them. Now, please don't misunderstand that. Of course it is right to help. And it's shameful to be in a position to help and not to. But it's equally shameful to take quiet pleasure in the fact that such circumstances exist in the world so as to occasion our needing to help in the first place. Does that make sense? It's shameful to take pride in one's ability to condescend. Shameful though that may be, however, it is also endemic to our broken human nature. Because we want to be above. We want to retain status over. We want to be the ones with power and in control. And to pretend that this is not the case is to be deliberately blind to the human condition. Not to mention it is to disregard everything the Bible says about the essential nature of sin. This is the very reason Naaman couldn't stomach the thought of his own healing coming from the Jordan River, an Israelite river. This is the very reason the people in the courtroom couldn't abide the notion that Tom Robinson felt sorry for Mayella Yule. This is the very reason that Jesus' disciples returned to him triumphant, rejoicing about how the demons and the spirits had even submitted to them. And thus, this is the very reason Jesus responds to his disciples' pride by invoking the very name of Satan himself. I watch Satan fall like a flash of lightning, he tells them. So see, he goes on, that you do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you. Instead, rejoice that you were known by and loved by God. You've been given a mighty blessing, Jesus is saying to them. So take not pride in somehow being above. For that, he is saying, is the original sin. This is why it was so important to Paul. Paul, the vaunted, puffed-up scholar and Pharisee who himself had had to learn this lesson the hard way, this is why it was so important for Paul that he impress upon the Galatians what it means to say that all have been made one in Christ Jesus. And because Paul believes this to be so important, because Paul believes this to be the very thrust of the gospel, he therefore wraps up his letter to them by saying, in effect, and since all have been made one, let us act like it. 2,000 years later, we'd all do well to listen to Paul. I know I would. I have far more of name in, in myself than I'd care to admit. I have far more of Harper Lee's lawyer in me than I'd care to admit. I have far more of the disciples in me than I'd care to admit. And if I can take the Holy Scriptures at their word, then so too do you. Because according to the Holy Scriptures, this is inherent to the very nature of our broken humanity. Oh, it is unpleasant to admit this, no doubt. But unpleasant though such an admission may be, to refuse to admit this truth about ourselves is to refuse the very gospel of Christ. Because to refuse to admit this truth about ourselves is to refuse the opportunity to be transformed. To be truly set free. To become a new creation. 
Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, Paul says. Meaning that there is no metric by which we can ever be any better or any worse before God than anyone else. Instead, he writes, and this is how he concludes that magisterial letter, instead becoming a new creation, an altogether new person, an altogether new humanity, instead becoming a new creation, he writes, is everything. Becoming a new creation in Christ. A new creation who recognizes that we are never above or beyond or beneath or superior to or inferior to or separate from. A new creation who recognizes that all stand as one before God, never in submission to one another, always in submission to Him. Would that we'd open ourselves up daily to that kind of ongoing transformation. Would that we'd allow God's Spirit to continue to make of us new creations. Would that we'd model on earth what it really looks like to live as one before God. And would that we'd always rejoice in the simple knowledge even in our sinfulness and brokenness, we, all of us, are known by and loved by God. To which all God's people said, Amen.